This lecture is about inverses of a matrix. And what we mean by that is just like with the scalar equation when we have alpha x equals beta, if alpha has an inverse, which we typically write as alpha to the minus 1, then we can flip that alpha over to the other side and solve for x equals alpha to the minus 1 times beta. Similarly for matrices. It may be possible to find another matrix called a to the minus 1 so that we can flip over that a from ax equals b to the solution x is equal to that matrix times b. So let's explore this. Here's an example of a matrix A. It's a square matrix 3 by 3. And when we compute the reduced row echelon form, we'll find that it is equal to I. So this matrix A has a pivot in every row. And we know that when a matrix has a pivot in every row, then AX equals B has a solution for any B. Otherwise, there would be vectors B for which AX equals B does not have a solution. The other point to make is when we have a pivot in every row for a square matrix, that means we have a pivot in every column, and therefore there will not be any free variables. That solution is going to be unique. So AX equals B will have a unique solution for every B, provided that A has a pivot in every row. So here's the idea. Any vector b can be written as the first entry times the first column of i plus the second entry times the second column of i all the way to the last entry times the last column of i. Here, the example that i is 3 by 3, but I could have vectors b of any size, and that observation will hold. Now, what we'll do is we'll ask for solutions of first equation a times some vector is equal to the first column of i, a times some vectors equal to the second column of i, a times some vectors equal to the third column of i. And if we can find such solutions, then what we can do is we can write b as b1 times the first column of i is now a times x1. The second column of i is a times the solution x2 all the way to the last one. And since we can factor out a, we see that b is equal to a times this linear combination of those vectors x1, x2, x3, with the multipliers just being the entries of the vector b. So we will have written down a solution of ax equals b as a linear combination of the solutions of these three problems. Well, what that means is, first of all, observe that that solution x is equal to b1, x1, b2, x2, plus b3, x3, is the column view of a problem, a matrix cap x times b, where that matrix cap x is made up of those three columns, of the column x1, x2, and x3. And since we know that ax equals b has a solution for every b, if and only if it has a pivot in every row, we know that this is possible if and only if a has a pivot in every row. If not, then at least one of these problems here must fail, must not have a solution, because otherwise we would be able to write down a solution. So we are about to try this, and we are going to exploit the fact that we can solve for multiple right-hand sides simultaneously by simply augmenting A with each one of the right-hand sides, but that means augmenting A by I, and then solving for each one of the columns of I, assembling that matrix cap X, and what we'll see is that assembling that matrix cap X can be a little bit error prone. So for small matrices, we're going to use Gauss-Jordan elimination rather than Gaussian elimination for simplicity. And you'll see this in a moment. So here is a little bit of Julia code to implement all of this. So we start with that matrix A that we've given above. We augment it with I and then derive each one of our elementary matrices and multiply it into that augmented matrix AI to reduce A to reduced row echelon form. And once we have that, I have written a little display routine called GE. We're giving it our stack of matrices. And when I run this, it gives me our layout in the standard form we've been using. So let's look. I have my matrix A. I've augmented it by I. I compute each one of the elementary matrices and what I get when everything succeeds, a pivot in every row, but the reduced row echelon form for a pivot in every row is I. So my matrix A will have been reduced 
to the matrix I. And now that I have that, the result is easy to read out. A times x1 is equal to the first column of I. The solution x1 is 20 minus 5 minus 7. Similarly, a times x2 is equal to the second column of i, has solution 5 minus 1 minus 2, etc. Now, when I assemble those solutions back into a matrix, here it is. That is that matrix cap x that we've been talking about. What we have done, therefore, is that with Gauss Jordan elimination, a has reduced to i. We see the solutions of Ax equals each of the columns of I as the columns that appear below. And when we apply all of that into a matrix, what we have actually achieved is that A goes to I and I goes to this matrix that we have been looking for. So for any B then, the solution of Ax equals B is X is equal to this matrix times B. And there's only one such solution that we indeed have a unique solution for our problem Ax equals b. If we look at the algebra, we see something interesting. Here's my stack of matrices again, and I've transcribed it into the algebraic form. So we start with Ax equals i. We multiply in all of our elementary matrices to make a into i. So e3, e2, e1 times a has become i. And therefore, we wrote down the solution cap x. But that stack of matrices that reduces A to I is the same as the stack of matrices I see on the right hand side, because I started with I. All I'm doing when I'm multiplying in those elementary matrices E is I'm keeping track of that product of matrices. So what I see is that I'm trying to solve AX equals I, and I found a solution cap x. But that solution cap x has the property that x times a is also equal to i. So solving ax equals i yields the solution of x a equals i at the same time. It's the same matrix. Note that for this to hold, for this to work, that matrix a must be square. Otherwise, we couldn't multiply it over to the other side. Now, the other thing is that this result holds for matrices of any size. I've written it for an example of size 3 by 3, but there's nothing in that example that would prohibit me to write it for any square matrix. In summary, then, what we have found is the following. We start with a square matrix A, and we find that there is a unique matrix X such that AX equals I and XA is equal to I, if and only if A has a pivot in every row. And since the matrix is square, that will mean if and only if A has a pivot in every call, just as well. That matrix is actually the product of our elementary operation matrices. It's easy to solve for. All we have to do is solve the matrix problem, A times cap X equal to I. That matrix cap X we call the inverse of A, and we'll write it as A to the minus 1 power. The construction of X shows that if I have a second matrix B, and I claim that that matrix B is the inverse of A, to prove that that is indeed the case, all I have to do is check that A times B is equal to I, or B times A is equal to I. It's sufficient to do just one of these products, and if indeed it multiplies out to I, then I can state that B is the inverse of A. So as an example, here are two matrices, the matrix A and the matrix that we actually computed as the inverse of A, and to check that that is true, all I have to do is take A times this matrix and find that it is equal to I, or equivalently, I could start with this matrix on the left times A and show that that is equal to I to show that this matrix indeed is the inverse. Let us now look at the case where we don't have such an inverse matrix. So here's an example where I specify a matrix A again, augment by I, set up my Gauss-Jordan elimination to reduce that matrix to reduce the row echelon form, and display it. Here is what we get. I've taken my matrix A, I've augmented it by I, I've done Gauss-Jordan elimination steps, and I found a row of zeros. So my problem AX1 is equal to the first column of I has a contradiction. It does not have a solution. Actually, none of the three problems have a solution. And therefore, no, there is no such matrix A inverse that when multiplied into my matrix A 
yields i. Now the inverse, when we can get it, is great for algebraic manipulation. Suppose I have ax equals b, and I know that a inverse exists, then I'm multiplying a inverse from the left to get a inverse ax is equal to a inverse b. And since a inverse a is equal to i, I've written down the solution x equals a inverse b. I've flipped over the a from the left to the right as a inverse. Now, that looks like a perfectly good way of computing the solution, but numerically, it's actually a bad way of doing things. It's far preferable to solve ax equals b directly, for example, by using the LU decomposition. Since we did compute the inverse, however, let's use it. And again, I'll show a little computation with Julia. So here's my matrix A, repeating the previous computation to find the inverse of A. So let's pull it out of our stack of matrices. Here is the inverse. And I'm given a right-hand vector, let's say minus 3, 4, minus 14. And therefore, the solution of AX equal to that B is X is equal to A inverse times B. So I can compute that and print it out. But Julia has a solver. And the way to invoke the solver is matrix A backslash B. And that will give us the solution directly. So here's the result. I'm taking A x equals B. Uh, here's my B vector. And I computed the inverse of A times that B vector, 2 minus 3 minus 1. And if instead I use the backslash operator A backslash B, I get the exact same solution. Now, what if A is not square? Could we do anything there? Let's look at the problem A times cap X is equal to I. In the first case, A has more columns than rows. And therefore, when I'm looking at pivots in A, I can indeed have a pivot in every row of A. I've got enough columns to do that. And so I stand a chance of solving a times cap x is equal to i, and all I really need is a pivot in every row for that to succeed. If a has more rows than columns, then I will necessarily have rows without a pivot. And therefore, a times cap x equals i cannot possibly have a solution. So more columns than rows stands a chance of finding such a matrix. As long as I have a pivot in every row, I will find one. But on top of that, since I have more columns than rows, I will have columns without the pivots. So I will have free variables. That matrix cap X, those solutions, those columns of X, will not be unique. So if A is not square, it must therefore have more columns than rows for there to be a possibility for a solution. And when there is, when I have a pivot in every row, there will be free variables and that solution will not be unique. But to obtain all solutions, therefore, I do the same thing as I had done before. I'm going to write B as a linear combination of the columns of I and compute that matrix X times the B vector to get a solution of AX equals B. And then to get all solutions, all I have to do is add a homogeneous solution of A times X is equal to zero. So let's look at this when we carry it out. So here's a matrix A. It's got three rows and four columns, and therefore it's possible to solve AX equals I if we have enough pivots. And when we carry out the computation, this is what it looks like. Here's A augmented by I. We try and reduce it to reduced row echelon form. Indeed, we succeed. And we have this extra vector over here. Now notice that if I set the free variable equal to zero, that's equivalent to throwing out the column that doesn't have a pivot in it. And I'm reduced to a problem that looks just like before. I'm reduced to a square matrix and the inverse of that square matrix appearing here on the right-hand side. Setting that free variable equal to zero is equivalent to putting in a row of zeros. Uh, it was the fourth variable and therefore a row of zeros for the fourth row of that matrix cap X that we're looking for. So here is the matrix cap X such that A times this matrix here indeed yields I. We can also trivially read out the homogeneous solution. So X4 is equal to let's set it equal to one. Then X3 is equal to minus one. X2 is equal to plus one and x1 is equal to 0 for the enters of that vector. So here's the homogeneous solution vector. 
all of the homogeneous solutions are alpha times that vector. And so the solution of Ax equals b is given by x is equal to that matrix cap x times b plus the homogeneous solution. And this works because indeed there is a pivot in every row. Let's try to do this twice. I'm going to take my matrix A and I'm going to solve with I on the right hand side. So A times cap X is equal to I. And I'm going to display it. So here is my matrix. And you'll notice it's not the matrix that we got here. The reason is that each one of those solutions here is not unique. Each one of the solution vectors has a homogeneous component that we could add to it. And so here's another solution, another matrix cap X, such that A times cap X is equal to I. Let's verify it. Let's compute A times cap X. And indeed, given the numerical imprecisions, I see a tiny little negative component in these two entries here, but it multiplies out to I. So what we did is exactly the same as before. We computed A times cap X equals I. We found that there is such a solution that there is in cap X is equal to, again, the product of the elementary matrices. And this time the matrix A did not reduce to I. So it doesn't hold on the other side. AX equals I is fine, but XA is not equal to I. Since we solved AX equals I, that matrix X, that non-unique matrix X, we'll call a right inverse of that matrix A. And the left inverse, if we are asking for, well, could we do it the other way? Could we solve XA equal to I instead? Well, XA equals I, I can convert to the previous problem by just taking a transpose. So I could try and solve a transpose times a matrix equal to I and try and get it that way. In summary then, what we have is we take a matrix of size M by N, and if M is less than N, if I have fewer rows than columns, then indeed I may be able to solve AX equals I. I'm going to find right inverses, if and only if A has a pivot in every row. But if I look at the left inverse, uh, A transpose has too many rows, so the left inverse will not exist. Similarly, if I have a matrix A and it has more rows than columns, well, then the left inverse is possible. I'll have an infinite number of left inverses if and only if A has a pivot in, well, A transpose has to have a pivot in every row, so if and only if A has a pivot in every column. And the other way around, the right inverse will not exist. If M is equal to N, however, that's the sweet spot. A will have a unique left inverse if and only if A has a pivot in every row, and hence every column, it's on no free variables. And similarly, A will have a unique right inverse if and only if A has a pivot in every column, and hence in every row. And therefore, if they exist, the left and right inverses are the same. A inverse of A is the left inverse of A and the right inverse of A. Now, the way that we normally prove that the inverse of A is unique is to consider the following. Let A be a square matrix. If it has an inverse, let's assume it has two inverses. Let's call them B and C. So A times B is equal to I, B times A is equal to I, and similarly C, A is equal to I, and A, C equals I. Let's start with the expression A times B is equal to I. We know that that's true since B is an inverse of A. What we'll do is we'll multiply by C from the left. That gives us CAB is equal to C times I. Well, C times I is equal to C, and therefore we have the second expression here. And we're going to use the fact that we can combine matrices to look at the product of C times A. Well, C is an inverse of A, and therefore C times A is equal to I. And multiplying that out, that into B, we finally get the expression that B is equal to C. So we started with the assumption that we have two inverses, B and C. It turns out that those two matrices must be the same. So if A has an inverse, then that inverse is indeed unique. The takeaway for today then is as follows. We'll start with a square matrix of size n by n. We had defined the inverse of A to be a matrix such that A times that inverse is equal to I, 
and that inverse times a is equal to i. We found that if such a matrix exists, it is unique, and further that if we are given a matrix B of the same size, of the same square size as A, to check whether or not B happens to be the inverse of A, it's sufficient to check whether or not A times B is equal to I, or B times A equal to I. We can multiply them together in either order. We also found that if A is not square, so if it's of size M different than N, then we may have either a left inverse or a right inverse, but not both. If m is greater than n, that is, if we have more rows than columns, then we may have an infinite number of solutions for the equation xa equals i. And if we do, then such a matrix x is a left inverse of a. If we have more columns than rows, then the problem Ax equals i might have a solution, and a, such a solution is called the right inverse of A. And again, we will have an infinite number of solutions if we do. A square matrix A that has a pivot in every column will have an inverse. To compute the inverse, all we have to do is solve A times cap x equals i. For numerical computations, computing the inverse of A is a bad idea. And usually we don't need it in practice. We have algorithms to solve our problems that avoid the inverse of A. However, algebraically, it's great to write things down. So we have Ax equals B. We know A is an invertible matrix. Then we know that has a unique solution. And the unique solution can be written as X is equal to that inverse of A times B. And finally, if a matrix of size n by n is invertible, that is, if a inverse exists, then that solution, x equals A inverse B, obviously exists for every B and is unique.